Hey everyone and welcome to episode 3 of Front Suspension Geometry where we're going to talk about toe, dynamic toe and Ackerman. Um, we've, we've rigged up this display to show really well with this dial on the top that has a camera directly above what's going on dynamically throughout your travel range, how to set up your toe and how to adjust it, and what other characteristics of the geometry is affecting your dynamic toe. So to start, we're going to cover what is the definition of toe. Toe is the difference in angle between your left and right front wheel. Your static toe is adjusted using the toe rods or tie rods, depending on where you're from, we call it different things. The tie rod is simply adjusted on our kits using a left and right thread. As I lengthen and shorten the tie rod, it is changing our toe setting on the wheel. Dynamic toe is described by the difference in angle throughout your travel range between the left and right wheel. So for a just very basic um, explanation, as you're turning your wheel, you're going to have a different ratio as the wheels increase in angle. I've hatched this um, steering rack on the back here with hatch marks that are quarter inch apart. A quarter inch is also about six millimeters apart. So with each movement, we're able to see that a quarter inch of movement from a neutral position is going to move the wheel at an increase in angle per movement. So to try and explain that a bit better, if you're moving the rack a quarter of an inch from when your wheel is straight, let's just say a quarter inch of movement is going to give you about two degrees of change. And then we're gonna move another quarter inch and we're getting about a three degree change. But let's skip ahead to near the end of our rack's travel range, right here, where I now move a quarter of an inch on the rack and it ends up moving the wheel from 35 degrees to almost 45. So near full lock we're getting a travel range of 10 degrees with the same rack movement. This is what we call dynamic toe and it's dynamic because it's constantly changing throughout your steering's travel range and this can be exaggerated by your rack location as well. If your rack is further forward, you're gonna have less dynamic change than if your rack is far away. A good example of two chassis where you're gonna get a lot of dynamic toe versus not very much dynamic toe would be a Corvette. A Corvette steering rack cannot be moved back. It's a front rack car, so the steering rack cannot be moved back, meaning that we are set in stone the amount of dynamic change that we're gonna see on a Corvette chassis. Whereas other cars like BMWs and Supras, um, where the rack is positioned almost linear with the control arm and the ball joint, you're going to have less dynamic toe change throughout your travel range than you would on a car that has a rack that's further away. And this is also applied on rear rack cars. If you have a S chassis and your rack is in the factory position, you're gonna have more dynamic toe change than somebody that has relocated their rack forward. So we're gonna display this with examples by moving the rack all the way back and moving it all the way forward. And we're gonna see that change on our scale. The other thing that we need to talk about is Ackerman. Ackerman is described as the difference in angle between the lead and the trail wheel. This difference is set by the tie rod's position in reference to the control iron ball joint, the outer ball joint. And this relation is what sets the Ackerman for the car. It is separate from dynamic toe change, but it works hand in hand with it. Well, the definition is different, but it works with dynamic toe change and it will affect your dynamic toe change as we're gonna see on this graph. So with those three topics, static toe, dynamic toe, and Ackerman, they all work together and are going to give you the type of feel that you're gonna get with your car. So let's go in, static toe is simple. So let's dive into some demos. So for the purpose of this demo, we had to zero out and make sure that everything was set so that we are able to accurately measure the difference in the dynamic toe change. So at the knuckle, we have where we're gonna be adjusting our Ackerman. At the top here, we have a dial that is gonna be telling us when our wheel is at zero toe or zero degrees. And then we have our rack, which I have two lines on the rack that have the rack in a centered position. So the travel range to each bump stop is going to be exactly the same. 
This is important when we're going through our travel range to note because when we change our Ackerman and we look at our dynamic toe, you're going to see different angles on the wheel, but with the same rack travel range every time. This is what's going to demonstrate extremely well what's happening with your steering. So I'm centering the rack, we're zeroing the dial, and I just have to make a slight adjustment to this to zero the dial. We are going to check our toe. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Had to try and push a bit harder. We have successfully zeroed out everything on the display. Our toe is set to zero in reference to this board. This is our zero plane and we have zero toe. We're at zero degrees of angle. Our Ackerman is unknown at this moment and our steering rack is directly in the center of its travel range. So for this demonstration, Let's go through our travel range and take note of the angle that we're getting at each limitation. So for this part of the video and this demonstration, we're going to be simulating a rear rack car. So we have the front of the car on this side, the rack is at the back side of the pivot point, so it's a rear rack car, and we are gonna go through and show you the dynamic toe change and the Ackerman difference and what we're gonna do and how it's gonna affect it. So on our trail wheel, we will go to full lock the rack is hitting the bump stop right here, which is the limit of this rack's travel range in that direction. These limits are set the same distance from the middle on both sides. So we're gonna get the same travel range. We are seeing on our trail wheel an angle of 49 degrees with this current Ackerman setup. Now we're going to go to our lead wheel and check the angle. And we are sitting at, I would put that at 49 degrees. It could be 50 just based on how the dial's reading it. But we're gonna say that we are at a zero Ackerman setup for the display purposes. With everything zeroed out, we're going full travel range to the lead, full travel range on the trail, and we're getting 49 degrees, and we're getting 49 degrees. This is what we call parallel steering or zero Ackerman. To adjust this, we're now gonna show you what Pro Ackerman looks like and what it does to your car on a rear rack setup. To adjust the Ackerman on this setup, I've got this tight enough that it's gonna rotate the knuckle, but also not tight enough that I can't move it with my hands. So I'm gonna set this up to give us a Pro Ackerman setup. Now when I move this, you'll notice that it moves the position of the rack. That's okay, because all we need to do is adjust the tie rod length to re-center the rack with zero degrees on our dial. So I'm gonna put the wheel at zero. I'm gonna adjust my tie rod to re-center the rack. So now that we've made our adjustments to the Ackerman and re-zeroed the rack, dial, and static toe, we can go through the travel range and simulate what's happening once we've changed that Ackerman. This is again a rear rack car. On our trail wheel, we're reading 45 46 degrees. And on the opposite, on the lead wheel, we're gonna be showing about 52 to 53 degrees of angle. So again, with the exact same travel range on the steering rack, going lead and trail, with this adjustment made to our Ackerman, we now have a difference in angle at full lock. And we're also gonna have a difference in dynamic toe throughout the travel range. So without doing increment by increment, I'm gonna just show you that a quarter inch of movement from zero toe goes from zero to three degrees, and the same amount of movement will go from 44 to 53. So you can see that the dynamic toe in relation to the movement of the rack is changing and it actually increases significantly as you get closer and closer to lock. And then the same effect is gonna happen on the trail wheel. So let's go for some reverse Ackerman. This is pro Ackerman for a rear rack car. We're gonna change it to show anti Ackerman on a rear rack car. Anti Ackerman, typically if you're just visually looking at any, any knuckle that's on a rear rack car, the tie rod is going to be further outward than the ball joint for the control arm. 
A lot of times that you won't be able to tell just by looking because most knuckles have a angle on the knuckle. This angle is to give the ball joint a better angle to match the KPI in the caster. So if the ball joint is at an angle, as the ball joint is extended out, the ball joint is actually going forward and the tie rod in relation to that is hard to visually see. So if you're looking at just the top of the hole where the ball joint goes in, that does not necessarily mean that it has anti-Ackerman because the lower control arm ball joint is extending further outward. As it goes down, because of the angle, we'll show you a picture of a knuckle with the angle on it. Um, so this is gonna be an example of anti-Ackerman. So since we've adjusted here, we need to lengthen our tie rod to re-center the rack. You can see this is our center line and I'm going to lengthen the tie rod until we reach that center line. So we're gonna zero our dial, we're gonna zero our rack, and since the dial and the wheel are connected, zero on the dial means zero static toe. And now let's go through our travel range and show you what's changing when we move to anti-Ackerman. So throughout its travel range, we're gonna go to full lock on our lead, where we're getting an angle of 45 degrees. And then we're gonna go full lock on our trail. This is where it gets interesting. The same travel on the trail wheel brings us to almost 60 degrees. And you guys saw where I made this movement on the Ackerman. I really didn't move it much. I moved the tie rod pickup point further outward. And if we were to look at a plane from the front or from behind, the difference in relation to the ball joint is not that far. If there was two lines drawn straight through following the plane of the vehicle, we might have a quarter inch or six millimeters difference between these two points, giving you that much difference in your lead and in your trail angle. And this is the best example that I could give you for Ackerman. Now let's switch the rolls and make this into a front car, which all we're gonna do is just change the arrows and talk about things in basically the opposite effects. I'm gonna re-zero my Ackerman, then we're gonna cycle through our range, and you're gonna see what the difference would be as if the front of the vehicle was on this side of the display, and this was the front of your steering rack. And then after this, we're going to move the rack and check our, how the ratio is changing for our dynamic toe, and you'll see when we move the rack further towards the control arm, we're gonna have less change in tow than if the rack was much further away. All of these things you'll be able to take as information and apply it to your vehicle because it applies to every vehicle. So let's switch the roles. Let's make this a front rack car. We'll start with zero Ackerman again and change it up. So we've changed it up. This is now a front rack car. This is the front of the vehicle. Our steering rack is in front of the ball joints and we're gonna show you the same simulation. I don't know if you watched the rear rack or if you just skipped right to this one, if you have BMW, Supras, whatever, all those cars have front racks. So let's go through a travel range and show the exact same thing. We actually haven't determined if this is a zero Ackerman setup or not, but we're gonna easily be able to determine that by showing what the travel range is of the rack and going the same amount both ways. So this would be our lead wheel on a front rack. So our lead wheel on this car is right around 51, 52 degrees. I know you guys are gonna be viewing this from the top angle. I'm just seeing it the way that I'm seeing it. If it's a degree off, um, forgive me. So we're sitting at what I can see to be about 52 degrees. And then we're gonna to go to our trail wheel. And this is gonna be sitting around 45. So right off the bat, if I wanted to zero this out to be parallel steering, I know that my lead wheel is turning further than my trail. So what should we do? We're gonna be doing the opposite than what we would do on a rear rack car. If I want to increase the angle on the trail wheel, I need to move the tie rod pickup point further inward towards the car. I just made a very slight adjustment from where we were, which was square to this and right here. And from our demonstration there, we saw that we had slight pro Ackerman still. So I'm going to make the adjustment, move the tie rod inward towards the car. I'm going to re-zero everything. Zero on the dial. I'm going to zero the rack. 
And let's see if we can get this to a parallel steering setup. So I'm hitting the bump stop there. We are at 49 to 50 degrees. And I'm gonna hit the bump stop here. And we are at 49 to 50 degrees. So right off the bat, we've made our adjustment. We are now at a parallel Ackerman setting. This means that the lead wheel and the trail wheel are getting the same amount of angle at full lock. This is not factoring in the dynamic toe. An easy example of dynamic toe is that if we went to, let's say, 20 degrees on the lead and 20 degrees on the trail, it doesn't necessarily mean that it takes the same amount of rack travel to get to each point because you have to factor in a number of different variables to assume that the trail wheel is increasing in angle at the same rate that your lead wheel is increasing in angle. There's slight differences. This is what we call dynamic because it changes constantly throughout its travel range. So with that, let's go ahead and set up our front steering rack car for a pro Ackerman setup. If we wanna to go to a pro Ackerman setup on a front rack car, we are gonna to have to move the tie rod outward in relation to the ball joint. So we're moving this towards the wheel. And with that, I'm going to re-zero our dial. I'm gonna re-zero the rack. And we're gonna be able to see a massive difference in relation to our Ackerman at full lock. So we now have a pro Ackerman setup for a BMW, for a Supra, for an RX-7, for a Corvette, and a number of different front rack steering cars that you guys can all relate to. Let's go through our travel range. Full lock on our trail wheel. We're seeing an angle of about 43 degrees. And now we're gonna go full lock on our lead wheel and we're seeing a massive difference. We're going up to, I would say around 63, 62, 63 degrees. So with a difference of adjustment being no more than maybe a quarter inch to three eighths of an inch or like six millimeters to 10 millimeters of adjustment, we're getting an angle difference of 43 to 63. So let's just call it a 20 degree difference with that minute of a change, giving us a heavy pro Ackerman setup. This would actually be relatively comparable to a factory um, setup on a car where pro Ackerman is fairly heavy with regular cars. We can go into how Ackerman works for grip driving. Ackerman plays a heavy role with the tire compound they're using and the slip angle of that tire and the amount of weight that's on that tire. But for drifting, it's, it's quite a bit different. So anything that you can read online to do with Ackerman really doesn't relate to drifting in the same way. We will talk about that at the end of the video where we can kind of just ramble on about a bunch of points and information that some of you guys may skip or may not. But with this, Let's continue on. I kind of got off course there. We're gonna set up our car for anti-Ackerman on a front rack. So to go anti-Ackerman, I wanna move the tie rod inward. So towards the vehicle. And I'm gonna move the tie rod. I'm not gonna to go too crazy. I'm just gonna adjust it to about there. So with that, I have to now zero my dial so that my toe is zero. Now I have to center the rack. Our rack is centered. Our toe is zero. Let's go through our travel range and see what's gonna happen. So on this setup, let's go to our trail wheel first. We're getting a reading of about 55, 56 degrees. Let's go to our lead wheel and we're getting an angle of 45, 46. So this would be a good example of an anti-Ackerman setup where we're getting a difference in angle around 10 degrees. Um, I didn't move it quite as much as I did in relation to the ball joint as I did for the pro, but it doesn't really matter because this demonstration is just showing you as you move the tie rod in relation to the outer ball joint, you're going to get a different Ackerman setting. And this is showing you exactly what that Ackerman setting would be changed to with very small changes. So with kits that have adjustable Ackerman, you're, you're going to see that the slot and the plates that they use have very small increments of movement because if you move the tie rod just a very slight amount, you're gonna get a difference in angle at full lock of several degrees. And this plays directly in line with our dynamic toe change. As I showed you earlier, with a quarter inch of rack movement when the wheel is straight, so just moving this much, 
You need to move the rack quite a bit in relation to how much you're steering. Because you're starting from a zero angle plane and the tie rod is almost 90 degrees in relation to the ball joint. A linear range of motion in relation to how much angle you're getting with the wheel. When we change that at full lock, if you're doing the same amount of rack travel, you're gonna get far more movement out of the wheel because of the dynamic toe change. The leverage that the tie rod has on the wheel, this is why the Ackerman plates that we swap out are such a small amount of difference because at full lock, you only need a couple millimeters or an eighth of an inch difference to make the angle at full lock change by this much. Okay, and that is why the kits that you see that have adjustable Ackerman, it's a very small amount. So you'll never see adjustable Ackerman that has the range that this kit has, but this is exaggerating and showing you what's happening when you're making those adjustments. And with that, we've successfully demonstrated positive and negative Ackerman for a rear rack car, for a front rack car, dynamic toe, which is the difference in angle in relation to the range of the steering rack. We can now just basically talk about what these setups are doing. I'm actually not gonna close because we still have to show you what happens when we change the rack position. The next thing that we're going to do is change the offset of the steering rack and we're gonna show you how that affects our dynamic toe change throughout a full travel range of the steering rack. To demonstrate dynamic toe change by moving the steering rack, I have the steering rack at its maximum position away from the pivot point. This is simulating on a rear rack or a front rack with how the toe is going to change. We're going to disregard any kind of Ackerman setup or difference in angle because we're just focusing on watching what happens when we move the rack forward and backwards. So with that, we have this zeroed out. So we're gonna show you one inch of movement or 25 millimeters of movement at the full lock range. So this is basically one inch away from when the rack is running out of its travel range. So I'm gonna line mine up, line the rack up and go from here to full lock. And let's measure that difference. So we're gonna see that we're starting at an angle of 29 degrees and we're gonna go and it ends up around 50 degrees. So we've now moved our steering rack as far as it'll go towards our ball joint position. And this is gonna simulate if you had a rear rack car, if you relocated the rack forward, or it's gonna simulate the majority of front rack cars and how they already are. Starting with an angle of, let's call this 28 degrees, and moving to our full lock position, we are getting a reading of 46. So to summarize the dynamic toe change in relation to moving the rack further forward, in relation to the rack moving closer to the ball joint or further away from the ball joint, you could see on our first test where the rack was at its furthest away point from the ball joint, we got a reading of 29 degrees and it increased to 50 degrees with one inch or 25 millimeters of rack travel range. When we move the steering rack all the way as close as we could get it to our ball joint, we did the same exact test where we had one inch of rack travel, but we got a difference in the reading of our angle. We were reading 28 degrees, and then it went to 46 degrees. This isn't a demonstration that is to go linear or alongside anyone's specific setup. What it's showing you is that when you move the rack, you are dynamically changing your toe curve. And this is the simplest way to show it. You can see it right here on the numbers. There's a difference in the amount of angle and there's a difference in the increase of angle. When all I did was move the rack, every other variable was the same. So with that, we've covered everything that you need to know and understand about toe, dynamic toe and Ackerman and how it's gonna affect you and your car. As far as your car's setup, it's really going to depend on what you're running for spring rates, sway bars, roll center, your setup, your just your, your corner balancing. You're just going to, there's going to be so many variables that are going to play a role in how you're going to be setting up your Ackerman and also for the types of tracks that you're using, how you're going to set up your Ackerman. So there is no way that I am able to tell you without knowing what you drive, without knowing anything about you or your car, what Ackerman I would recommend. The only time I can recommend is during the sale of our own kits. We make suggestions on the Ackerman that works best, but again, it goes hand in hand with tracks and corner radiuses and so on. So 
With that, if we're just going to start going on about the arguments of why you should run pro Ackerman, why you should run anti Ackerman, I'm going to use a clip from my friend uh, Tom. Tom recently made a video on Ackerman. He actually posted it today. He explains really well why he runs anti Ackerman. The thing to note about Ackerman is that when you're reading about it online and when you're measuring it, you are acting as if the wheels are completely connected to the, to the road and in relation to your turn, they're like they're on, they're on rails. But what we're not accounting for is the massive amounts of slip angle and, and change in the duration of the tire where the tire's heating up, cooling down, it's gripping more, it's gripping less, it's slipping more, it's slipping less. And all of this plays a factor in, in Ackerman. But using his display, you'll see that depending on tracks, like let's say you're, you're drifting at Irwindale, which has a massive bank, and then you're going to a go-kart track. If you had the same Ackerman setting for Irwindale as you did for this go-kart track, you're going to have massive differences in scrub on your tires. This is because as your car is rotating and drifting around a much smaller radius, you're going to find that you need a lot more anti-Ackerman for it to properly track around these corners. And the opposite effect happens when you're going to a larger track. You actually would still need some form of anti-Ackerman. And let's note that this is based on a computer or paper simulation. Um, and the reason why I'm saying that is because in uh, like 30 seconds or something, I'm gonna show you why some pros may still prefer pro Ackerman or positive Ackerman. So on paper and in a computer, anti-Ackerman is what's gonna give you a no scrub, fastest in corner speed um, setup. But the reason why some pros may prefer a parallel steering or a pro Ackerman setup is because they prefer the behavior of the car on initiation and whenever they're starting to a drift. But then while they're in drift, there is so little weight on the trailing wheel that it actually plays almost no role in the behavior of their car because they're steering with their lead wheel only. What I mean by that is they have a large sway bar in the front, they're not running or they may be running helper springs. And all of this plays a factor in unloading that trailing wheel and putting all of that weight on the lead wheel. And when you have a, let's say 100 pounds or less weight on the trail wheel, and we're referring to Ackerman, there's really not going to be much that that trail wheel's doing in the behavior of the car because it's either off the ground or it's barely touching the ground. A lot of times drivers like Pro Ackerman because of how it actually slightly scrubs while in drift and it makes drifting easier to drive. It encourages the rear to swing out and it encourages it to stay out while you're in drift where anti Ackerman has no scrubbing force or alignment force for drifting it's going to be completely dependent on your throttle control, your own left foot braking, and then a lot more driver feel. Um, and that would be more if we were to say like we're on a small track, like a go-kart track, where there isn't enough weight jacking or weight transfer to unload that wheel, and both wheels are touching the ground and in contact. This is where anti-Ackerman on a small track is important. Some people don't like the feeling of anti-Ackerman or zero or parallel steering and that's totally fine because at a level like in formula drift where you can set up your car to have so much rear grip that you're completely unloading the trail wheel totally fine you're not using it you could run pro you could run anti the only time you're going to notice it is on initiation basically and then once you begin that drift in that corner there's so little effect that that tire is having that it doesn't mean anything this is just a lot of information. So with that, there's quite a bit to talk about. We pretty much zeroed out our caster, our KPI, we have a slight angle. I, I just did this so that our needle was relatively straight on the top of our dial and so that you could really see what the Ackerman's changing. Um, like I said, everything's dynamic to do with a vehicle. So to close, that is what's happening with your chassis when you're setting up your Ackerman, your toe. Take this information and apply it to your setup. And don't forget to like the video, comment on the video, your thoughts. We're already taking into account a lot of the guys that have commented on if they like music or not, if they like this or not, I need to look at the camera more. We're taking it all into consideration and we're making these videos better for you to understand. We're also trying to cover more front rack and rear rack stuff at the same time. And we'll put that in a description on the video so you can go to front rack or rear rack 
and easily understand depending on whatever setup you're using. Um, thank you for watching. Um, don't forget to subscribe because that's really going to help us do more and more and more videos and a lot of really interesting things in this shop. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next episode.